Like an experiment better from the darkest corners of the human side. Idi Amin descended upon Uganda like a madman. Perhaps he was truly a madman. A monstrous shadow eclipsing the sunlit promise of a flourishing nation. In order to make it absolutely clear to you, I have been honored by the highest order of the conqueror of the British imperialism in Uganda. His reign was a storm that tore through the heart of Africa. His tyranny, an echo of the horrors past, painted the lush landscape of Uganda with red shades of blood and despair. A hisla of the Nile, Amin transformed a once hopeful nation into a graveyard of dreams. Today, we tell the story of perhaps the most dangerous dictator that ever ruled an African country. Of course, for certain, the most brutal dictator of Uganda. The Butcher of Uganda is perhaps the boldest name on the dark pages of African history. Idi Amin Dada Ome was born in unclear circumstances in the 1920s in Uganda. Some account place his year of birth as late as 1928, but British governmental records put his birth year in 1925. However, no records were kept for native Africans in that time. He was most likely born in 1923 or 1924. His place of birth is also in dispute. While some accounts infer that he was born in Uganda's capital Kampala, Idi Amin was most likely born in Muslim-dominated northwest of Uganda, near today's South Sudan. He was the third son of Andres Nyabira Tomoresu, a Catholic who had converted to Islam and rechristened himself Amin Dada Nyabira Tomoresu. His mother, Aisha Ate, was by all accounts a Lugbara. She was a traditional healer and a midwife. Aiming to strike a balance with Germany's colonial possessions in East Africa during the First World War, the British colonial regime created and trained the Uganda military with one of the units called King's African Rifles. Amin joined the King's African Rifle as an assistant cook in 1946, when he was 23, and took on military training till 1947. His claims to have joined the army during the Second World War and fought on the Burma front against the Japanese were largely fabrications by Amin himself. Athletic, energetic, and enthusiastic, Amin rose quickly in the KR, keeping promotions as fast as possible for anyone of African descent. When the Kenyan opposition to British rule began in 1952, Amin was among the troops sent in to maintain British interests against the Mau Mau rebels. He was promoted to corporal that year, then to sergeant in the next. Amin served with distinction during this campaign in Kenya, but would later try to downplay his involvement in squashing a rebellion against British imperial rule. Amin was so good as a mid-ranking military officer that he was sent on a course to Scotland. He would later on propose to become the King of Scotland, as we will see. Upon his return to Uganda in 1959, he was given the title of Effendi, the equivalent of a Class II warrant officer the highest rank any African could attain in the British Armed Forces at the time. Amin achieved this feat after just 13 years of service. The man who Amin would go on to become showed himself in late 1961 when the KR sent him to squall a cattle rustling crisis between Uganda's Kamarajong and Kenya's Turkana nomads on Uganda's border with Kenya. Amin commanded his platoon to massacre scores of villagers. Amin was not caught martial because Sir Frederick Crawford then governor was eager to avoid a scandal involving one of the only two indigenous commission officers on the brink of Uganda's independence. As always, the British in Africa, political considerations triumphed over justice. By the time Uganda gained independence from Britain in 1962, there was no cohesive plan for succession. At independence, many African countries had political groups headed by people who had been educated abroad and returned to their homelands determined to achieve self rule In Uganda, however, there was no coherent movement or political parties by the late 1950s, which made it difficult for a smooth transition from colonial rule where independence was declared on the 9th of October 1962. Nevertheless, three major political parties quickly emerged. The Democratic Party representing the Catholic population, the Ugandan People's Congress representing the Nilotic people of the North, and the Kabaka Yeka, a Bugandan nationalist party. In Uganda's first elections post-independence in 1962, the People's Congress and the Kabaka Yeka united, and the UPC leader Milton Obote became the country's first prime minister, 
Obote was tasked with governing a country that had been an artificial creation of British colonial regime, consisting of people with differing values, ethnicities, and soon enough, a crisis was brewing. There were calls for a devolution of powers which would see each region govern itself. The crisis climaxed in 1966 when Obote suspended the country's constitution and became a dictator. We are interested in building a united country and our policy will not be persecution of any person. Our policy will be to build our own country and we are not going to talk in terms of Sir Edward. We are going to talk in terms of Uganda. All over Africa in the 1960s, it was an era that saw strong men seek power and declare totalitarian regime. Obote was just following a trend. To Amin, who had risen through the ranks of the Ugandan army post independence, Obote's grip on power was good news. When we left Idi Amin before Ugandan independence, he had been one of the only two commissioned officers in the Ugandan army. At independence in 1962, he was promoted to captain, then a major the year after, and deputy commissioner by 1964. By 1970, he had reached the peak of Uganda military and was made overall commander of the armed forces of Uganda. This rise through the military was purchased through his complicity in Obote's corrupt dealings in Uganda. Amin had been aiding and abetting Obote in gold and ivory smuggling between the Congo and Uganda. With Amin enriching himself in the process, the deal, as later alleged by General Nicholas Olenga, an associate of the former Congolese leader Patrice Lumumba, it was part of an arrangement to help troops opposed to the Congolese government trade ivory and gold for arms supplies secretly smuggled to them by Amin. It was the discovery of their smuggling operations in 1966 that led Obote to seize absolute power. Unknown to Obote, the dog he was feeding so generously will come to bite him and bite him hard. Although Amin was close to Obote and was considered his right hand man, he began considering to seize power for himself. He began recruiting an extensive number of people from the Kakwa and the Nubi areas of Uganda, who he identified with as his ethnic people and fellow Muslims. This strategy ensured that he had the highest number of loyalists within the army, a necessity for squashing any form of dissident within the military when he seized power. He was also cutting the support of Britain and Israel for his group. Britain was wary of Obote's socialist policies in the wake of the Cold War, and Israel would support anyone that would foster his interests. All this met perfectly into Amin's plan. The soil was fertile, the cloud had gathered, and the seed was ready. A coup was about to happen. Amin's relationship with Obote, lubricated by the excesses from their corrupt dealings, soon experienced a friction. Obote, who had been growing weary lately of the court following Amin enjoyed from the military and still nursing suspicions about Amin's complicity in the attempted coup that he had survived in 1969, demoted Amin from overall command of the Uganda military and appointed himself to the role in 1970. He then tried to prosecute Amin on charges of financial misconduct, but it was too late. Before the idea of a prosecution was conceived in Obote's mind, it had already hatched in Amin's. On 25th of January 1971, while Obote was away at a Commonwealth of Nations meeting in Singapore, Amin launched a military coup with the help of Israeli government agents. He declared himself the restorer of the constitution, promising to hold office for just a few weeks before transition to democratic rule. The members of the Uganda Army and Air Force decided to take over from the civilian role because of the the last arrangement which were made by the Dr. Apollo Milton Obote to disarm the whole tribe of Uganda except his own tribe Langi and Achodi. And also that is the point which brought all this problem. Obote returned to nearby Tanzania and spent the 1970s there in exile. Amin's few weeks will translate into eight years, as he oversaw the most brutal dictatorship in Uganda's history. On 2nd February 1971, one week after the coup, Amin declared himself President of Uganda, Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, Uganda Army Chief of Staff and the Chief of Staff. The new regime quickly moved into a military one, with no pretense about respecting the rule of law 
or any other institutions. Military tribunals soon replaced court systems, and I mean supporters within the army were appointed to senior political positions. While the coup that installed him as a dictator was almost bloodless, I mean spent the next few weeks purging both the military and the civil institutions of people he deemed supporters of Obote. These people with their numbers in thousands were not only stripped of their positions, I mean had them rounded up and shot. This was the beginning of massive bloodletting that characterized his regime. I mean Mutini did not go on a post. When Obote returned to Africa, he took refuge in Tanzania. Uganda's neighbor to the south. Julius Nyerere not only offered him asylum, but he also refused to recognize the legitimacy of Amin's regime. Soon, Obote was joined in exile by over 2,000 Ugandans fleeing Amin's crackdown. These fleeing Ugandans were soon conspiring to remove Amin and forming bands of military trained guerrilla fighters. Among these forces was a young Goweri, Museveni, who later on played a crucial role in Ugandan politics. More on him later. In 1972, 1,500 of these exile forces swung into action. They crossed into Uganda to unseat Amin. Their plan did not see the light of the day. As the coup turned out to be a botched affair, swiftly suppressed by Amin, who had prior intelligence about the coup. He was unforgiving of the rule of Tanzania in the whole affair. The early years of Amin coup was welcomed by the international community. Having supported his coup from the beginning, Britain and Israel quickly moved to recognize his government. By their calculations, Amin would be easier to deal with than unreasonable Obote, and Amin was more than happy to fan the flames of their delusions. He visited England in 1971 and even had lunch at Buckingham Palace, where he called on London and Tel Aviv for weapons to help secure the country and maintain law and order in pursuit of their interests, they were more than happy to oblige him. His allies in the West soon got a measure of the man they were dealing with. Following the spat of death that followed his early days in power, Two American journalists had been investigating the cause. Against severe warnings, they had gone to Mbarara barracks to investigate. Unfortunately, they met their ends. America responded by sending David Jeffrey Jones to investigate the death of his compatriot. Jones quickly discovered that both men had been killed by Amin's men, and he had to even flee the country without completing his investigation for fear of being killed. Foiled by his growing disgust with Nyerere's Tanzania, Amin requested armed forces from the West to take the fight to the southern neighbors, but he was denied. Believing to have lost the West as allies, he set out to North Africa to make a new friend, one in particular who was not a friend of his estranged allies. When he met his senior colleague, another co-dictator, Libya's colonel Muammar Gaddafi to solicit support in the form of weaponry, Amin presented himself as some default Muslim. He also managed to present Uganda as having a 70% Muslim population when in real sense, the truth of the number was around just 6%. Gaddafi believed these lies and welcomed Uganda to the Organization of Islamic State. Amin promised to restrict the religious freedom of Christians back in Uganda and in return for Gaddafi's weapons. Back home in Uganda, Amin continued his crusade against the Acholi and the Lingo ethnic groups who opposed his regime. By 1972, at least 5,000 soldiers from these ethnicities had been killed and at least twice as many civilians had disappeared, which caused more fleeing to neighboring countries. It did not matter if they were in the army or were religious leaders or even local politicians. Bodies were often found floating in the river now. But even at this stage, the international media was oblivious to the degree of the carnage going on in Uganda. Amin soon introduced himself to the foreign media when he widened the scope of his prosecution to include ethnic Asians in Uganda. I know you're asking, ethnic Asians in Uganda? Well, there's an explanation. Indian and Asian settlements in Africa could be traced as far back as the 12th century. But the number of these Asians coming into Africa increased following the downing of the age of globalization. By the end of the Second World War in 1945, there were close to a million of these Asians, largely from India, living in East Africa, bolstering the region's economy and amassing quite some wealth for themselves. By the middle of the 20th century, over 85% of commercial trade and industry in Uganda was in the hands of Indians. Amin was uncomfortable and he sought to wrest control of the commercial activity from the hands of the Indians and place it in the hands of Ugandans. It was this war against the Asians that introduced Amin to the international community. Actually, I took this decision for the economy of Uganda. 
and I must make sure that every Ugandan get a fruit of independent. Since independent, actually Uganda is not yet independent, I will say that, even when the British handed over on the 9th of October 1962, the Uganda still not yet independent. Uganda will be independent after this, my decision, after I want to see that the whole Kampala Street is not full of Indians. It must be proper black and uh, administration in those shops is run by the Uganda. What will happen to these people if they don't go by the time of it? I think they will be sitting like they are sitting on the fire. I will tell you this. You just wait after three months. What will you do to them? Okay, you will see. <laughs> <laughs> On the 4th of August 1972, Amin declared economic war and decreed that those of Asian descent living in Uganda without full Ugandan citizenship leave the country in 90 days. This move particularly unsettled Britain, who had promised the Asians in Uganda British citizenship should they desire it during Uganda's independence in 1962. It was clear where these Indians were heading. When this promise was made, Britain did not anticipate that it would have to take in tens of thousands of refugees at once. When Sir Edward Heath's government in London tried to dissuade Amin from pulling through with the expulsion order, or at least delaying it, Amin did not even give a response. At the moment, our main worry is to kind of get out of this country safely. We are not even worried about our belongings or our things. But what we would like is personal safety. What do you think about the fact that the Asians, the British Asians are leaving? You no, know, actually, that's a bit of a difficult question for me. You mean my attitude yes. about the yes, your going? Attitude. Yeah. Anyway, it's good. It's good for them to go. When the chief judge, Benedicto Kiwanuka, objected to this decree, he was imprisoned and executed on the 22nd of September. Kiwanuka's ears, noses, and lips were severed. He was castrated disemboweled before his body was finally set ablaze. The message Amin was sending was clear. No one should get in his way. With the 90-day deadline drawing to a close in the beginning of November, and the Asians having witnessed all the Amin's was capable of, panic ensued. Eventually, a United Nations emergency airlift was required at the 11th hour to bring 27,000 Ugandan refugees of Asian descent to Britain. Though they may have escaped with their lives, the same could not be said of their belongings, as they were robbed of their possessions on their way to the airport. Amin took the businesses these Asians left behind and handed them over to his cronies within the military, who were not particularly adept at running businesses. Soon, the Ugandan economy was in trouble. By the middle of the 1970s, the Ugandan economy had eventually grounded to a halt, if not reverse. Soon, there was a shortage of everything the deported Asians had produced or imported into Uganda. Prices more than doubled, but Amin was not done. He had more trouble to make. Having turned his back on Israel and Britain, Amin nationalized all British-owned businesses and turned to Libya and Soviet Union for support. He even condemned the West's efforts at ending the apartheid regime in South Africa, calling it meddlesome. When nascent Scottish Liberation Army, a French paramilitary began a terrorism campaign in their country in the hopes of forcing Scottish independence from Britain, Amin not only supported them, but also offered to become the king of Scotland, should they need him to perform the role. Such was the level of madness Amin had descended into. Of course, no one took him seriously. By 1975, the Soviet had provided Amin's government with $12 million in economic assistance and $48 million in arms. While his disgust for the West grew, and the feeling could be said to be mutual because of the sanctions heaped upon his regime by the same friends that had helped foster it, Amin nurtured a continuous love for Western goods. Despite the sanction, Amin and his top officials often had planes loaded with goods from London, carrying luxury goods for Amin and his top officers. It was called the Whiskey Run. While all of this were happening on the international stage, Amin continued his brutality at home. He was relentless in his persecution of any Ugandan who was not Muslim, from his tribe, which was a minority, or at least a Baganda. Despite making up just 6% of the Ugandan population, Muslims occupied 80% of the top position in military by the late 1970s. 
Most of Amin's killings, torture, and disappearance was facilitated by State Research Bureau, a secret police established immediately after Amin seized power. The SRB was all taxed with detecting and prosecuting Ugandans for dissent. Amin was essentially the Hitler of Uganda. Amin married at least six wives and sired at least 50 children. In the mid 1970s, his state of pioneer was reaching disturbing levels. He became increasingly unstable and unpredictable to even his inner cycle. In 1974 alone, he divorced three of his wives, two of whom died under mysterious circumstances in the months that followed. He often went into boats of rage and frenzy, suspecting all those around his court of planning to overthrow his regime. Some theories attribute Idi Amin's erratic rule of Uganda to untreated syphilis contracted during his military service. By the 1970s, it was speculated that advanced stages of the disease had induced dementia, potentially explaining the bizarre conduct and cannibalism accusation. However, Henry Kemba, a Ugandan minister under Amin, offers a different perspective in his book, State of Blood. Kemba suggests that Amin's behavior was rooted in his Kwaka tribe background, renowned for its warrior culture and blood rituals. While these practices, including consuming enemy flesh, are believed to have a spiritual significance, Kemba asserts that Amin's actions went beyond ritual, as the former dictator personally confessed to acts of cannibalism. Amin's descent into international paria began with a telegram to the UN Secretary General, Kurt Walden, in which he praised Adolf Hitler and misrepresented the Holocaust as gas-based extermination method experiment. This public endorsement of Nazi Germany irreparably damaged Amin's already strained relationship with the Soviet Union, his last major ally. Amin's reputation reached a nadir in June of 1976 when he allowed a hijacked Air France plane to land at Entebbe Airport. The hijackers, members of the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine and German revolutionary cells, released 156 non-Jewish hostages who held 83 Jews, Israelis and their supporters captive. In a daring rescue operation, 100 Israeli commandos stormed the airport, freeing almost all of the hostages and blowing up all of Ugandan Air Force's planes stationed at the airport in a mission that lasted just 90 minutes. When Amin awoke the next morning, he nearly went mad. In retaliation for Kenya's assistance in the raid, the commandos had stopped and refueled in Kenya. He ordered the killing of hundreds of Kenyans living in Uganda. After this episode, it was clear to the international community Africa was dealing with a madman. Uganda's vice president under Amin was General Mustafa Adrisi, appointed in 1977. Being a man of charisma himself, the Ugandan army was soon divided into forces loyal to him and those who were loyal to Amin. General Adrisi intended to purge the military of those he termed foreigners, and the Sudanese who had been recruited by Amin because he considered them a part of his skin. This disertification in the army led to several coup attempts, with Amin getting wounded on one occasion. By 1975, the number of Amin supporters and close associates had shrunk significantly, and he faced increasingly dissent from the populace within Uganda as the economy and the infrastructure collapsed as a result of the years of neglect and abuse. After the killings of Bishop Luwum and ministers Oriema and Obot Ofumbi in 1977, several of Amin's ministers defected or fled into exile. In 1978, Adrisi was severely injured in a car accident and was flown to Cairo for treatment. While there, Amin stripped him of his position as Minister of Defense and Minister of Home Affairs and denounced him for retiring senior prison officials without his knowledge. Amin then proceeded to purge several high-ranking officials from his government and took personal control of several ministerial portfolios. The shakeup caused political unrest and especially angered Adrisi's followers, who believed that the car accident was a failed assassination attempt. In November 1978, troops royal to Adrisi mutinied. Amin sent troops against the mutineers, some of whom had fled across the Tanzanian border. Fighting consequently broke out along the border. Amin used this incident as an alibi to start a war with Tanzania. The incursion had been an initial success, with Amin even announcing his plan to annex the Kagera region of northern Tanzania at the end of 1978. By January 1979, Julius Nyerere, Tanzania's president, decided that he had had enough. He mobilized the Tanzanian People's Defense Force and started a campaign against Amin's army in the north. Joined by several groups of Ugandan exiles who had ended as the Ugandan National Liberation Army, Amin's army retreated steadily 
despite military help from Libya's Muammar Gaddafi and the Palestinian Liberation Organization. By the spring of 1979, the bulk of the Ugandan army had been pushed back into Kampala, the country's capital. The decisive engagement of the war occurred at the Battle of Lukaya on the 10th and 11th of March, which saw a devastating defeat of Amin's forces. Even with a joint force approaching Kampala, Amin initially refused to step down at the ruler of Uganda, but later bowed to pressure and eventually fled the country by helicopter on the 11th of April, the date celebrated by many as the end of Amin's regime. Ugandans thought they had seen peace at last, but they were mistaken. Following the deposition of Amin, a loose civilian government was soon formed out of different groups. This government could not govern effectively because it was divided along conflicting lines of interest. And soon, another coup happened in May 1980. Unlike Amin's though, the military regime led by Polo Muunga conducted elections and handed over to the winner, none other than Milton Obote. Obote's return to power did not go on a post. Many groups believed the polls had been rigged to favor Obote's Ugandan People's Congress. As a result, Uganda was soon plunged into another war, involving guerrilla taxes between those who did and did not recognize Obote's legitimacy. The so-called Ugandan Bush War dragged on for five years, between Obote's government and the guerrilla fighters led by Yuri Museveni. The guerrilla fighters soon got the upper hand, and Museveni, who had fled the country as a young man in his 20s, became Uganda's new president. Museveni, who was perceived to be a breath of fresh air, was an old wine in a new bottle. He has remained in office to date and is one of the world's longest serving head of state. And Uganda still suffers the same human rights abuses and persecution of minorities that was characteristic of Amin's reign of terror. It is difficult to put a number on how many deaths Amin's regime was responsible for because of Uganda's ill-defined population at the time, making it difficult to draw inferences from census data and because the many killings and disappearances were not recorded officially. However, despite these limitations, Amnesty International posits that Amin's regime killed at least 300,000 people between 1971 and 1979. Though other sources put the number at between 420,000 and 800,000. What is undoubted is that Amin's regime created immense hardship for the people of Uganda and is among the most brutal dictatorships in Africa's history. After fleeing Kampala on 11th April, Idi Amin did not leave Uganda immediately. Instead, he attempted to establish an opposition government in the eastern part of the country. This endeavor proved unsuccessful, and he subsequently sought refuge in Libya under the protection of his former ally, Gaddafi. Amin's final destination was Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, where he was granted asylum in 1980. I am fresh, strong, and I am concerned with the situation in Uganda. But are you keeping track of the situation all the time? How do you manage that thousands of miles away? I have all Ugandans at heart and they keep me informed and uh, all Ugandans, except the only few, uh, might be opposing me, but the most of them, they love me, they pass their information to me, and uh, they want me uh, to save them from the chaos situation which is now happening in Uganda. Despite the atrocities committed under his regime, Amin evaded prosecution and lived out his days in Saudi Arabia until his death from kidney failure in 2003. The story of Idi Amin is a reminder of some tragic episodes in African history. If Africa must rise, we must ensure this never happens again. Thank you for watching this episode. Kindly share, subscribe, and send to your friends. Till I see you again, bye bye.